I love it when these men folk get up here and sing. Praise the Lord. We still have the peace speaker. He can speak peace to your soul today. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. We couldn't even come to church this morning if we haven't made peace with the Lord. God is good. Next two Sundays, I'm going to be speaking about the real story of Thanksgiving. I want to depict to you what happened uh, when the Pilgrim Fathers came over here to land at Pilgrim uh, Plymouth Rock and uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Uh, Brother James calls it Taxachusetts. Is that okay? Anyway, he's from there. And he's glad he's in Mississippi. But irregardless of where we are from in America, most of our ancestors came from the northeast part, New England area of our country. Why? That's where they came ashore. And uh, Thanksgiving, I want you to know about Thanksgiving. It is a scriptural holiday, I should say, holy day. Take time with your family. Take time for these feasts. Uh, the early Pilgrim Fathers had three days of feasting. I'm for it. Amen. I'm praising the Lord for that. They had turkey. They had deer. They had lobster. They had shellfish. They just thanked the Lord for everything that God had given them. And I, I love this psalm this morning, or this uh, psalm of David in the Chronicles. This is a psalm of thanksgiving that we heard. What a blessing to hear people thanking God. Uh, what a blessing. By the way, our Pilgrim Fathers, the first book that they took off the boat was the Bible. Amen. Amen. And thank God they made the, the Mayflower Compact. I don't know if you've ever read that or not. It is the predecessor uh, to our Constitution of the United States. Uh, Mr. John Adams said that it, uh, it was so intricately uh, connected to the Constitution, one could not be without the other. In the Mayflower Compact, you'll read about it, I don't have time to quote it to you. Maybe next Sunday. I'm going to bring it a little out each week today and then next Sunday as to what happened when these dear people came over. It took them 66 days to come over from, from, uh, from England. In that compact, it says that we are here. They signed their name. 43 men signed this compact. It's a social compact that they agreed to get along with one another. I like it. It's kind of like our church covenant that we have. We, we've agreed to get along. If we can't get along, we, we say, hey, you know, uh, I'll back out gracefully and I'll go somewhere else without any kind of conflict. Amen? But here it says that they, uh, they signed this compact, and notice it says this, and a covenant they made for the advancement of the Christian faith. The advancement of the Christian faith. Now think on it. From 1608 to 1620, they went to Holland seeking religious liberty. They were under persecution for being Christians. They left Holland and they boarded a ship called the Mayflower. And they came over here to this world and this free world. And the minute they, they came off the boat onto the shores, they dropped to their knees and thanked God. Amen for the new opportunities and the freedoms to serve the true and the living God. That's our forefathers. That's how America was founded. That's why I say that this holiday that we are celebrating in the next week or so is very scriptural. It is something that we need to pay a close attention to. 102 people came over on this ship called the Mayflower, and they were wedged between two decks. This was the cargo space of the boat, and they only had about five and a half feet of headroom. Let me give you some facts about this voyage before we get into the message. 
The ship normally carried wine. Now, they weren't carriers of wine, but this is what it was used for before uh, they got on there. And it acted as a disinfectant. When they got on the ship, this wine that had been spilled out in the boat before they got on board killed all the bugs and the diseases and such because of this strong drink that they were carrying around. By the way, it'll kill you if you put it in your body. You heard it said right here at the house of God this morning that the preacher stands against liquor and alcohol, beer, but beer is bad. I, I used to, uh, uh, wine coolers, anything else that's alcoholic, amen. I used to pull out magazine pages when my kids were little and I'd throw it down on the, the ground if it had a cigarette commercial in it or a beer commercial or a wine commercial or such and I'd say, whiskey is bad. They'd see me do it. Whiskey is bad. And I'd stomp on it. Amen. Cigarettes are bad. By the way, the pilgrim fathers, the fathers that came over here to form our country were separatists. What does that mean, a separatist? Not only did they want to be separate from the state, they wanted to be separate from the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So they came here with a divine purpose of living for God in a holy way, in a holy manner. And I hope that's your determination this morning. I hope you have that holy desire to serve the Lord. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Come out from among them and be ye separate people, holy people, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You know why God's presence isn't real in our country anymore? Because we're touching the unclean things that we shouldn't touch. We're getting involved with things we shouldn't get involved with. Saying our Puritan fathers and our pilgrim fathers were very holy people. They were separate people. Now, during the terrible storm that they came across uh, the, the, the Atlantic Ocean, there was a terrible storm, and the main beam of the mass was cracked, and death was certain if this beam could not be repaired. And this could easily have been the, uh, the end of the pilgrim adventure on the bottom of the ocean, but one of the pilgrims had brought uh, with him on this, uh, this uh, uh, boat a large iron screw likely for a printing press that was used to repair the beam and it saved the ship and all that was on board do you believe in the providence of God do you believe that God got them here and that God established a free world Thank God for it. After 66 days at sea, land was sighted off what is now Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And this is not where they wanted to go, by the way. Your life may not end up where you want it to go, but you must surrender your will to God's will. Do you pray that prayer daily? Not my will, but thine. You need to pray that prayer. And they wanted to be in what is now uh, the Hudson Valley, which was then the northern part of Virginia. They wanted to go there. And the, the wind steered them to a different part uh, of uh, the country, a little bit north of there in Massachusetts. And some have said that, they, that there was strangers on board, some Englishmen that was not a part of their church group. And they uh, paid the, the, uh, uh, the shipmaster uh, to go further north. I don't know how true all these tales are, but I do know this. They, they landed further north in the Hudson River. And we do know this. They were hostile Indians living where they wanted to go. You see, sometimes where we want to go is not where God wants us to go. God always knows best. God always knows what's best for his people. And he took them to Massachusetts. He took them where the Indians were friendly with them and they'd already cultivated and cleared the land and uh, uh, later on these Indians would die but they taught them how to raise corn. They taught them certain things of how to get along and they made a 50 year covenant with them that they would not go to war with them and God was extra kind and gracious to those people uh, that came over here first. Now once they arrived the pilgrims barely survived the first winter. Uh, only four families escaped without bearing at least one family member during that harsh, harsh winter. They got here November. And by the way, they signed the compact November 11th. So you know New England's already been experiencing snow already. 
And so that's where they were, and uh, there was a, a hard winter ahead of them. But you know what? God was faithful during that time. He got them through. And in the spring of 1621, he sent an Indian by the name of Squanto who was fluent in the English, na uh, English language. Now, how uh, ironic, how, 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 how I'm, I'm asking a question this morning, how, how, how much of a chance do you think that would have happened, just happenstance circumstance? This Indian by the name of Squanto had been taken to England by earlier people who'd come through. He learned our language and he spoke to these people. He helped these, uh, uh, these pilgrims as they came across. And as a young man, he was taken to England as a slave. He mastered the language. He later was freed and returned to his native territory shortly uh, before the pilgrims arrived. Now that was God, another act of providence of our Lord. Probably the most important thing that Squanto taught the pilgrims was how to plant the Indian winter staple uh, corn crop. Amen. By the way, they had a terrible drought. Would you believe that before uh, that corn crop came up, those pilgrim fathers fasted and prayed for many days? And God gave the increase. They had the, they had the crop because they prayed. Amen. Your prayers go up and the blessings come down. Try it sometime. It works. Now the pilgrims thank God for this uh, wonderful helper. And they shared the gospel. You see the reason for them coming here? They wanted to take the gospel to every creature. Mr. John Wesley was sent here. <laughs> to be a missionary to the Indian people. Isn't that wonderful? He traveled over seven, uh, 70,000 miles. Can you imagine? On horseback. Talking about this man who started uh, the Methodist uh, religion. <laughs> uh, he, he, he preached till he was 88 years of age. Uh, he'd roll over dead. He'd roll over in his grave this morning if he knew what they were doing in the churches that he started. He was a soul winner. He was a circuit rider. He was a preacher of the of the gospel of righteousness. That's the kind of people that came here to our country way back when. I'm just thanking God this morning. Thanking God that we have a Christian nation today. All because people wanted to come here to escape the religious persecution that was going on in Europe. They came here with one purpose and one purpose in mind, and that was to honor and to glorify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They gave this man, Squanto, the gospel. Squanto died within a year or two after coming to the aid of the pilgrims, but before he died, listen to this, it must have worked their influence on him because he asked them to pray for him before he died that he might go to be with their God in heaven. Our God. The same God that saved our soul. We're praying that we'll see Squanto one day in heaven. <laughs> the messenger that God used to help the first group of people that came to the Americas. I can trace my history back on my father's side to 1630, which is only about 10 years after this. We were some of the first settlers of Connecticut and also uh, Rhode Island and New Jersey. The Cranes have been here a long time. Furthermore, we're going to stay here and pester you people from now on. Amen. Some call me pastor and some call me pester. I've come to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. I've come to preach the gospel to you who are at Gulfport also. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to see first of all this morning from our text about Thanksgiving. Let's learn about it from the Bible now. Singing accompanied to Thanksgiving. In verse number seven, we see that David delivered this first psalm to thank the Lord in the hand of Asaph, his brother. Now, Asaph, you have to know in the scriptures, he was the chief musician for David. He was the choir master, Brother Joshua. He was the one that got people stirred up about singing praises unto the Lord. David here orders a choir. You'll find in verses four through six. And then we see that he gets Mr. Asaph involved. And Mr. Asaph, take this thing to another level. Everyone is beginning to praise and to thank God 
for the many blessings in their life. That's wonderful. Verses seven, uh, verse number nine, we see we're to sing praise unto him. Notice who we're singing to. We're singing psalms unto him. And it says, talk ye of all his wondrous works. So not only are we to sing praises with our lips, hmm? we're to talk all through the week of his wondrous works. Those songs that they sang here last Sunday, I've been humming them and I've been singing them all week long. One song that they were singing, if you remember, the congregation stood up last Sunday because it touched their heart. Singing touches the heart. Singing prepares the heart for the preaching of God's word. We need singing. Let me ask a question. Maybe you're not a member of the choir, but do you sing praises and thanksgivings unto God? Do you catch yourself in the week singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord? Do you sing to him? I'm not talking about singing rap. I'm not talking about singing rock. I'm not talking about singing secular music. I'm talking about singing praises to our God. He's the only one worthy of our songs and praise. We're supposed to glory. We're supposed to glorify God in our singing. We're supposed to seek the Lord with our songs of praise unto him. We're to remember his marvelous works that he hath done and think on it for just a little while and sing and sing and sing. They will forget when I was little. And they will forget the songs that I learned growing up. And they will forget learning in the summer camps. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. And all I have to do is follow. My Lord knows the way through. He does too, by the way. Amen. And they will forget singing songs and hymns. Sing Hosanna. Sing Hosanna. Do you teach your kids songs? Sing Hosanna to the... You know, you'll live longer if you sing. Did you know that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine? Do you know if you keep a positive approach to life and a positive spirit and sing and keep your mind and your heart focused on Jesus Christ, not your problem, you you need to keep your mind and your heart focused on the solution to the problem. His name is Jesus. We're singing songs of victory. Amen. My life verse is Psalms 107, 8, 15, 21, and 31. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to us, the children of God. Any wonders in your life? Any miracles? Any answers to prayer in your life? Maybe that's why you are not singing. It's because you're no longer in fellowship with God. You've not had an answer to prayer in an awful long time. Mr. Wesley, I told you about him a while ago. The man who went 4,000 miles on a, uh, on a horse a year. He rode by horseback. He preached over 40,000 sermons. Boy, we're living in a wimpy age, amen. The doctor told him he had to slow down. He was preaching about eight times a day. Are you listening? He was up in his 80s and the doctor told him he's got to slow down. And so he slowed down from preaching eight times a day to six times a day. He literally died his last breath. He was preaching the word of God. Listen to it now. Mr. Wesley asked Miss Wesley to record the prayer answer. And every time that she recorded it, they numbered it. And it is said that Mrs. Wesley hollered out with a praise to God on the 50,000th answer to prayer of Mr. Wesley. And we struggle from day to day and from week to week not knowing and seeing the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You want to have the best Thanksgiving you've ever had? Get that prayer channel back open between you and God. Have fellowship with you and the Lord that he is now pleased with your life. Repent of your sin. Turn from your sin and turn back to God, Christian friend. 
then the answers to your prayers can start coming in. And then you will understand and recognize and see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And then you'll begin to thank him more. And then you'll begin to praise him more. Amen. So singing accompanies the Thanksgiving time. I believe that. Before you have your turkey carving, why don't you all hold hands around the table and sing a song of praise? What about Amazing Grace? You don't know many songs? Okay. Everybody knows Amazing Grace, by the way. Uh, you know the gentleman who, who wrote the song, Amazing Grace? Someone help me with his name. John Newton. Mr. Newton was a slave trader and a very terrible sinner at that, but God saved his soul. He cruelly treated these people like animals, but God saved him to write a song of praise. Do you think if God could save a sinner like that, he could save you and me? You think if God could save Fanny Crosby, who wrote over 8,000 hymns? It's recorded that she wrote many more anonymously because she didn't want to take any more credit for her songs and wrote them and put other people's names beside them. There's 8,000 that we know that she wrote. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Go through your hymn books sometime. You'll see them in there. She was blind. Oh, by the way, on her deathbed, she said, somebody asked her, would you like to live life with your full eyesight? And she said, no. She said, because the first person that I want to see with my new eyes is the Lord Jesus Christ. And she said, I doubt that I would have had the faith that I had with my full eyesight. And I wouldn't have written all these songs. Maybe God's been good to, too good to you. Maybe that's why you're not doing anything for him. Maybe that's why you're not serving him. I promise you one thing. You take a, a couple trips down to the Memorial Hospital, you'll start praising God. Amen? They start taking body parts out of you. My wife's had five major surgeries in the ab abdominal area. I told the doctor, I said the last time before they opened her up, I said, Doc, <clears throat> me and you's got to have a little talk. I said, if there's anything else that needs to come out, go ahead and take it out now. I'm tired of trotting up here to the hospital. Amen? When she was having all those babies, bless her heart, thank God for you women folk. I told the doctor again, I said, Doc, is there any way you can put a zipper right there so that we don't have to have all this pain next time? <laughs> all right. Give him praise today. Hey, have you thanked your wife lately, men folk? Are you treating her like a tyrant? Are you browbeating her? Are you up with, upset with her all the time? That's why she's not feeding you very much. That's why you're sleeping in separate bedrooms. Yes. Now look, I'm telling you, getting right with God has its advantages because you, you want to get right with everybody else too. Come on now, help me preacher. I need some help up here. I feel like I'm all alone. The Bible says in Joshua 3 and 5, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow God will do wonders among you. The reason we can't praise the Lord and thank him for all of his wonders is because, I'll tell you why, we've not sanctified ourselves in so long. God cannot do the great wonders and the great miracles that he wants to do because we as God's people haven't sanctified ourselves and set ourselves apart for the master's service. So not only is singing accompanied in the thanksgiving, but sanctification is needed to truly have the right kind of thanksgiving. Look at verse 15. Be ye mindful always of his covenant, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. And by the way, it's not an option. It is a commandment that we walk in his statutes and in his judgments. And in his law do we meditate both day and night. And the Bible says we shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And whatsoever we do shall prosper. Amen. Then shall we find good success. The only time the word success is mentioned in the whole entire Bible is in Joshua 1 and 8. It is when a person totally consecrates their life and meditates on the word of God day and night. 
I want that kind of life. I don't know that I have that kind of life, but I want that kind of life. I want to not only be a saved individual, I want to be a sanctified individual. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Recently, I asked our staff of our church to look and see if there's anything in their life that was not pleasing unto the Lord and remove it and ask God to help them overcome and be an overcoming Christian in their personal life. Anything that would hinder the working of the Holy Spirit in our church or hinder uh, God using them in a great way. I know all of us as Christians, we want to be transformed in the image of Jesus Christ. But as pastor, I urge you, as I urge my staff of this church, I want to urge you if you want to have a thanksgiving unto God to sanctify yourself, a holy people, a peculiar people, zealous unto good works. Set yourself apart for God. Amen. Amen. Consecrate your life. Dedicate your life unto the Lord. Remember what God has brought you through. Remember where he found you. Billy Sunday was about to commit suicide, we learned in our Sunday school class this morning. He's about to jump over uh, off of a bridge and take his own life. There's something special about these songs we mentioned a while ago. He heard the rescue mission singing a song that his mother had sung to him as a boy. I hope I can help someone with this today that's kind of down and out and depressed. The rest of the story is Billy Sunday didn't jump. He was, a, he was a drunk. He was a professional baseball player, went bad. How many people knows, folks, that money has, has, uh, has changed their life for the worse? That's what happened to Billy Sunday. He was a great baseball player, but he got tangled up in the world. Heard that rescue mission singing that song that his mother had sung as a boy. He didn't jump, and thank God, he trusted Christ that day as his Savior. One million souls later, he was one of the greatest fiery preachers our country's ever had. He single-handedly took on liquor in Prohibition era, and it was against the law to serve or transport liquor across state lines. They shot people for transporting liquor then. What's the difference? Nowadays, the government is involved in the sale of alcohol. What's the difference, Pastor? It's still wrong. It's still wrong. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 20, I don't know why I'm going there, but I, I think we better. The holidays, the holidays are coming up. That means we need to make a holy day out of the holiday, amen? Proverbs number 20, wine is a mocker. You know, Billy Sunday would preach that if he were here, but since he's not, I'm going to do it. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby. In other words, you'll be deceived if you start drinking of it. It'll start making you look on strange women according to the Bible. Those two sins are linked together. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Now, do you believe the Bible or not? Let's go over to Proverbs 23. We're having a Bible study. Is that okay? Verse number 29 of 23 of Proverbs. Do you believe all the Bible or just the part you want to listen to? Who hath woe, in other words, who hath judgment, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babblings, who hath wounds without a cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. The Bible says here, don't even look at it, don't even go down the aisle that it's being sold on. Look not upon thou the wine when it is red, when it drink, it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an arrow. He said, Preacher, I can handle my liquor. That's not what it said in the beginning. It said, At the last. Once it gets a hold of you, once it puts a stranglehold on you and your sweet little family, once it takes bread and milk off your table says it stingeth like an adder and thine eyes shall behold strange women 
And thine heart shall utter perverse things, things that you wouldn't ever think of saying, things that you would never think of doing. But under the influence of alcohol, you'll do it. God help us all not to get caught up in it. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. They're just numb. They can't feel anything. Intoxication will do it. Being inebriated will do it. Somebody help me up here. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. I'm not going to ever do that again. I'm not going to go and take that bottle again. It's the very thing you do first. It's the devil's tool. It's the devil's tool. You know I'm telling it right today. I say that sanctification is needed to have a right thanksgiving. Don't get the Mogan David liquor bottle out and put on the Thanksgiving table. Don't get the guy with the long beard's new wine either that he's peddling on the TV. You love me. Go ahead and smile. I thought it was the, the new Andy Griffith show, but then they, they did so they jumped the ship. They took off in a different direction. Which way you think your preacher's going to stand on this? I'm standing with that book. I'm not condemning them because I might be subject to it before I end this life and I might become the, 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 uh, the alcoholic. And you'll have to come pray for me. But as long as I'm in the spirit, the Bible says we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh to do these things. We've got to stay in the spirit. This flesh of ours is subject to do most anything without the spirit of the Lord's accompaniment. We need God more today than we've ever needed God. We need this church today more than we've ever needed this church. We need singers in the choir today more than we've ever needed singers in the choir. We need to stir up the gift that lies within us. We need to come to church ready to worship the Lord, to praise him. Thank God we're not where we used to be. I'm not the man I used to be thanks to Calvary. I don't want to go back to that old way in that old world. I don't want anything to do with that which destroyeth lies and takes away lies and pulls them down to hell. I don't want that life and you don't want that life. If I were to have everyone in this room to raise their hand that drugs or alcohol has destroyed someone's life in your own immediate family, I'm almost positive that every family here has been touched by it somehow and in some way. We need to stay away from it. We need to shun it. We need to avoid it. We need to avoid the very appearance of evil. We're to flee from it, the Bible says. Put your Nike shoes on, amen. Well, I lost a lot of amens. But I dropped the old gospel plow on you this morning. Number three, and lastly, the sacrifice is needed for a rightful thanksgiving. Notice in verses 28 and 29, I would not forget to say this to you this morning because we need the whole counsel of God, amen. The Bible teaches us that we're as a thankful people as a holy people that have separated ourselves from this old sinful world, that we're to give unto the Lord. Did you read it this morning? Did you find out what God says about giving? Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Shall men give unto your bosoms? Running over, the scripture says. I believe the Bible. I love the Bible. It's changed my life. I'm not what I once was, but thanks to Calvary, amen, I'm not what I once was. I don't want to go back there to you. Let's look at First Corinth, or First Chronicles, excuse me, chapter 16, verses 28 and 29. Give unto the Lord, ye kindreds of the people. Does that mean when we feel like it, preacher? No, that's every week. We're to come into his house with thanksgiving, with courts, with praise, and being willing and uh, ready and, uh, to give an offering unto the Lord. Notice it says, the Lord made the heavens. We're to give unto him. Verse 28. Verse 29, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Come back tonight. We're going to be preaching about the names of God. I want everybody to be here. Most unusual message if God will let me preach it the way he gave it to me. 
Notice it says, Give the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him, worshiping. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Hard to worship God with unholy hands. Hard to worship the Lord with an unholy heart. Hard to give offerings unto the Lord when you have a selfish heart. You got to ask God to help you with this. You got to surrender after you say the very next step after salvation is surrender. It's God whatever you want. It's whatever you want me to do. Offerings are still asked of the Lord to be brought unto his house. You know, folks, I love you as your pastor, but your pastor has to help you. Every time we come to the house of God, we need to bring an offering to God. What happens if we miss, pastor? When we miss, we need to come to the office on Monday and say, here's my offering unto the Lord. They're needed, folks. What does God use in this world to get his work done? He uses men and money. Men power, man power and money. I'm thinking about all those dear people over in the Philippines that lost their life. On December the 4th, we're going to have a Filipino missionary come here. He's going to tell us about his homeland. He's going to tell us about what happened. Brother Joel, he's going to come here and he's going to tell us we've been supporting him for years. How are we supporting him, Pastor? We're supporting him, as Brother Joe said this morning, with our offerings above our tithes unto our missionaries. He has a church today over there in Cambodia because we gave him offerings for 15 years. Amen. We give them to the Lord. Say, is that why I came today, preacher, where you could tell me that? It may be. It may be. I don't know, but I know this. I don't want to cut off any of the blessings of God on my life. The Lord said he would open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings upon us. If we would do this one thing, he would also devour the adversary for our sakes if we would give unto him. We give our tithe unto him. So singing is accompanied with our thanksgiving. Sanctification is needed to truly have a thanksgiving and a rightful thanksgiving. And I say this, sacrifice is needed for a rightful thanksgiving. Preacher, I got bills due. Yeah, but you got to trust the Lord just like me. I got bills due too. You do too. Who are we going to put first, the bills or the blessing giver? I'm trusting in the Lord. I'm trusting you are too. We get a little weak. We get a little wimpy. And we say, well, God, I know you understand. And we put God back at, back there on the back burner and we forget about him for a little while. God, help us all. Amen. Oh, yes, thankfulness. You see, it's more than just with our lips. It's with our life. This is where the rubber meets the road. It's what I'm trying to tell you this morning. Hey, you know, those veterans we had here last week, they didn't mind giving their life as a sacrifice for us being here today. Our children and our grandchildren are either going to be blessed or cursed because of our sacrifice that we have here this morning. Are we going to have anything here left when this generation is over? Wow. I'm wondering about it. Do we respect God enough? Do we fear God enough? The Bible says, you'll find it over there in the Chronicles, I believe it's in chapter 14. It says there's one thing that teaches the fear of the Lord. One thing and one thing only, it's the tithe. The tithe teaches us to respect our God and to teach us to respect who God is. It's the breath, it's the air that he made that we're breathing. He said, preacher, should only Christians tithe? No, everyone should tithe. Christian or non-Christian, we're breathing God's air. We owe him everything. I said, we owe God everything. A thankful heart is a giving heart. A loving heart is a giving heart. Do y'all see the noodle envelopes we 
missed a couple of weeks of envelopes. I put some envelopes in the seat last night, and it says this, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. we got to give, folks. Hey, those World War II vets, they had their time to give. By the way, they've been giving all along. I'm sure of that. That greatest generation didn't just fight over there in that for our for our lives, and they didn't come back here to give. They gave more. It's our time to give. Maybe we can't praise God and thank God enough because we're in our heart we're guilty. Before you can have the right kind of Thanksgiving this new year, and this this year. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about what preacher said today. How's your singing department? Can you praise him? Can you thank him like you should? Amen. How about your sanctification? Are you who you should be? Are you Christian on Sunday and hypocrite on Monday? Come on now, help me. How about your sacrifice unto the Lord? Are you the given person that you ought to be? God help us. Hey, you know, salvation is needed for thanksgiving. I left this little S out, but can I add it right here at the invitation time? If you're not saved by God's wonderful grace, you can never give God thanks like you could. You can can be the best giver in this church and leave out of here lost and undone without God. You can be a member of this church and every other church in town. Your name could be on the rolls of those churches. But your name is not on the roll book of heaven. Can I tell you, your giving to this church is not going to get you to heaven. Your sacrifice is not enough. Obedience is better than sacrifice. You must accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And you better do it today. Oh, I'll, I'll do it one day, Pastor. No, you won't. So how you know I won't? Because you haven't done it so far. And who's to say if you walk out of here under the spell of the devil that you'll ever return? Am I right? You probably got mad at the last point and won't ever come back. If preacher has to say something about giving, people get mad. Well, scratch your mad place. I'm going to keep on preaching. It may be because you're lost, you're mad. If you get, if you get saved, you get happy. And when the plate is, is given out, you know what? You rejoice. The Bible says he loveth a cheerful giver. Hey, every time we have an opportunity to give or to sing or to sacrifice or whatever God asks us to do, we ought to sing the high praises of God. We ought to shout the victory. Every time a soul comes down here and trusts Christ as their personal Savior, we ought to have a holy spell unto God. We ought to go on our way rejoicing this afternoon if one soul was saved here today. Let's bow our heads for prayer, shall we? Father,